for giving me the opportunity to speak today. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. Before I get started, I would like to share with you what happened to me when I first visited the US 18 years ago. So my mom, my two brothers, and I were on vacation in the US. And one morning we had breakfast at a tiny little bagel shop. And the waiter there could clearly tell that we were tourists. So he asked us, where are you guys from? And my older brother replied, we're from Austria. So the waiter asked them, did you guys fly here or did you come by car? <laughs> <laughs> so I will never ever forget my first experience in the US. <laughs> I prepared some handouts, so please free, feel free to take one if you want one. So I came to the US about a year ago in April 2015, and Victor asked me two months ago if I would like to speak today. And I didn't think much about it, I said, sure, yes, I want to talk. Um, to be very honest, I only had a rough idea about what I will be talking today. And I heard many speakers because I go to a lot of conferences and there's a lot of speakers who uh, pretend that everything is like effortless and everything is easy and they talk about how great they are. And I love encouraging and positive people, but I also want to share with you today my challenges and I want to be different today. So when Victor called me on the phone a couple months ago to prepare for that speech, he asked me a bunch of questions about my family. And I remember that my answers were extremely short. And he kept asking and asking and then he also asked me, so what are you passionate about? And I remember I said, oh, I, I didn't feel comfortable talking about my passions at all. And I thought to myself that Victor didn't think I could ever talk about a topic for 30 minutes. The reason why I didn't want to share all the information was simply because I served in the Austrian military for 10 years and I was trained to not give sensitive information <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> so after the phone call was over, I thought to myself, well, um, I want to talk about something today which I'm very passionate about, which is very personal and which is also challenging for me to talk about to a bigger audience. So today I want to share with you my personal life story <coughs> and the difference between success and significance. Since I'm a believer, I also want to talk about my relationship with God and my, the difference that he made in my life. And I, I wasn't sure first if I, would, if I should share that with you, because I don't know everybody here, but when I posted the event on Facebook, a friend of mine messaged me and said, I hope you give God the glory for your passions in your life. So, and this message really encouraged me and I was encouraged to share that with you today. So the title of my speech is My Journey from Success to Significance. Everybody thinks about success, right? But how many of you have ever thought about striving after significance. What? You did? <laughs> cool, because then you might be answered to, to, you might be able to answer my next questions, which is, what do you personally think is the difference between success and significance? How do you define that for yourself? So please feel free to give me an answer. Well, I think when you say success, that's based on what society feels is success. 
very well, very good song. People have their own measure of what they think success is. You usually have to go back to peers or people around you what they think success is. Just like talking. Very good. I will come to that later in my speech. Um, yes, please. Success is your definition. Your definition. Very good. I will also be talking about that in my speech. Yeah. <laughs> in the last draw, I see a hand. Success comes from your mind, significance comes from your heart. Thank you. Leo. Uh, success is internal work, significance is really figuring out how to give that back. Oh, I like that, giving the giving back element. Okay, um, thanks. I see there's a lot of good answers here. <laughs> I'm only 30 minutes, so I want to get my message. <laughs> so the structure of my speech or my presentations is as follows. I have two parts. In the first part, I want to share with you my personal life story, and I want to share with you uh, a significant event that happened to me. And in... The second part, I want to talk about the difference between success and significance. And I also want to encourage you and to give you some tools for significance. So let me start with my personal story. I was born in Austria, Vienna, and I have two older brothers. They are 46 and 47. No, actually, he's 48. Now time flies. <laughs> <laughs> and I am the youngest in my family, but also the smartest. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I was 17 years old, I wanted to attend high school in the US, and a long-term family friend of ours, his name is Jim, he found me a private Christian school in Canyonville, Oregon. Nobody actually knows where this place is. Does anybody have a clue where it is? <laughs> yeah, that's what I expected because it's in the middle of nowhere. It's it's close to Roseburg, if you know where that is, I think. Yeah, that's so I had a really great time there. I enjoyed everything, except that it rained all the time and I don't like the rain. That's why I came to the US because it rains a lot in Austria. <laughs> I actually I remember the first term that I learned. The first term that I learned there was term. It's a very <laughs> it's a very useful term, right? <laughs> so I was also surprised to be able to choose my own classes because in Austria you can't choose your own classes because everybody has to take all the classes that are required for that particular level. And I was lucky to be able to skip math. Instead, I was able to take two PE classes. <laughs> and, uh, it, it was definitely back then when I developed my running skills. <laughs> and during spring break, my family friend Jim and his wife picked me up from Canyonville and we drove to Portland because they lived over there. And one day he invited me to come with him to his house church which was run by Alger and Gloria. And I was really surprised that you even have a house church. I've never heard about a house church. I didn't know that you could have like uh, uh, a church service at somebody's private house. I grew up Catholic, so everything is really structured and, and regulated. So I was totally surprised <laughs> about that. <laughs> And, but I remember, as it would have been yesterday, that it was that day that I gave my life to God and that I started my personal relationship with Jesus. And this was a very, very significant event for me. And a few weeks later, Alger and Gloria invited me to their workshop. It's called Heart Change Workshop. And that workshop is basically a, a workshop where you're able to experience the heart of God as your heavenly father. And that workshop helps you to be set free from past wounds, lies, perfectionism, um, bitterness, so all those things. So this workshop really made a difference in my life. And back then, 
I decided that I want to introduce that workshop to just as many people as I just can. And it, it was the most significant event that had ever happened to me. And this, is, this experience is also the reason why I'm also so passionate about the US. And also back then, I decided to, that I wanted to move and live in the US one day. So about two months later, it was time for me to fly back. It was very hard to go back. And the reason why it was so hard for me to go back is because I felt that Austria is really like spiritually dark. It's a very dark spiritual place. People don't know about God and it's just, it's just different. And, and since then I almost spent like every vacation that I had in the US. So and after I graduated from high school in, in Austria, I joined the military. And I loved my time in the military. The reason why I joined the military because I always wanted to do something different. And not everybody joins the military, in particular not a lot of women do. And I really liked my the, the training. The harder the training was, the better it was. I loved to shoot and to jump out of airplanes and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and after I graduated from the military academy, I deployed to my first peacekeeping mission in Kosovo. It's in the Balkans. Does anybody um, remember like the conflict in Kosovo? So I was deployed as a liaison monitoring team commander. So the role of a liaison monitoring team is to liaise with the local population and to monitor the political, economic, and social situation in order to make sure there is no renewed violence breaking out. And after my first mission in Kosovo, I, I loved the place and I decided to do my PhD in political science. And I decided to write my dissertation about Kosovo and the peace process in Kosovo. And I also decided to publish my book, which is called Positive Peace in Kosovo, A Dream Unfulfilled. So if you ever want to read something about Kosovo, this is the book you have to read. <laughs> <laughs> After I finished my PhD study, I was deployed to another peacekeeping mission in Kosovo, but this time I served as gender advisor. <laughs> I see an expression here, I was waiting for that. <laughs> to be honest, I hate the term gender advisor. The, the reason for that is because nobody knew what I was doing. It was a new function. <laughs> so it was good, I, had to, I could be very free, I was my own boss basically. So the role of a gender advisor has nothing to do with equal opportunity. It's taking into account the different security needs of men, women, boys, and girls in Kosovo. That's the main role of a gender advisor. And I remember that some people actually called me sex advisor. So I told them that's not my role. And after my deployment in Kosovo ended, I spent a couple more months in the Austrian Ministry of Defense. But I felt back then that it's now time to do something different and I decided to leave the military because it has never been my main goal to stay there for the rest of my life. Because remember, my goal was to move here and to live here. So um, back then, my brother, found out about a global e-commerce company and it's, it's a cashback company and we both joined that cashback company as independent business associates and I've, we, we really like that and since it's a global company we thought okay where can we go and where can we implement the concept and since I've been to Kosovo a lot and since I knew about that place I decided to go back to Kosovo, but this time as a civilian to implement that concept there. 
And I remember that it was one of the most challenging things that I've ever done because not a lot of people in Kosovo know, they don't know a lot about online shopping or cashback shopping. So it was very difficult to implement that concept. So at the same time, it's a fundraising program. I work with a lot of nonprofit organizations, churches, schools, charities. And the other reason why it was so difficult is because you might know Kosovo is a new country. It's only 80 years old and not a lot of merchants include Kosovo in their in their country drop down list. So not a lot of uh, stores <laughs> ship to that country. So it's very, very difficult. Um, but probably more significant than implementing this fundraising program over there was that I was able to organize the first heart change workshop in Kosovo back then. So remember the heart change workshop was the workshop I went through when I was 17 years old. So one day while I was over there, I got an email from Alger and Gloria. So these are the founders of the heart change workshop. And since they were uh, they were pretty close to Kosovo. I asked them if they would be willing to come over and organize that heart change workshop there. So they said yes, and they came over. I talked to the pastor of that church, introduced to them the concept, and he was willing to host that, that workshop. It was extremely crucial and powerful for those people because what you need to know is, and probably you know that, is like 90% in Kosovo are Muslim, 3% are Catholic, um, just a small percentage is Protestant, and like the rest is Serbian Orthodox. So all that people that went through that workshop uh, converted to Christians. And so they were really new believers. So that was a really powerful experience and I could really feel for the first time in my life that I could really make a difference for those people. I did a lot of great things before, but this was totally something different. And actually I felt that I wanted to introduce that heart change workshop to Kosovo actually during my first mission in Kosovo, but how would you do that if you're like in the military, you know, if you're in uniform, you can't do that. So to have that workshop was really like a dream coming true for me. And we really made a great impact. And I'm not just saying that because I actually checked in with some of the workshop participants. I'm still in touch with them. And I sent them a message like three days ago. And asked, I was asking, how is it going for you? And they told me that Elgin Gloria came over to Kosovo about three months ago in order to do a follow-up workshop and also the pastor of this, of this church and two of the participants are planning to come over to the U.S. In, in August to learn how to organize the workshop by themselves, which is very crucial. So this is a, a very big impact. And by, by organizing this workshop in Kosovo, we were able to make a difference in the lives of others. And this is exactly what I mean by significance. Success is about you, what you want to achieve in life, what you want to have. But significance is about others, how you can make an impact in the lives of others. So success is really a byproduct. Success is okay and I love to have success, but significance is, is greater. And I think that the most significant thing that you can do in your life is to help other people to get to know God. And I have heard so many pastors talk about that over the last years and I felt for me that it was time to move from just simply hearing that message to to doing it, to practicing it. Because I talked to, in Austria, I talked to a lot of people and said, so why don't you come to church anymore? And they said, 
Um, well, because you know I've heard that message all over again and I know everything already. But the, the real question is, are you doing it? So let me share with you my next step in, in life. So I stayed a few more months in, in Kosovo, but then I really decided it's time for change to move forward and I decided to move to the US. I didn't plan that trip for a long time, I just decided that like from one day to the other. It was very hard for me because at the same time I told my mom, okay, I'm leaving again. <laughs> so it's, it's not that easy. So actually I started out in in LA first because I love that place, I love the ocean, I love the hills, I love to run in the hills. And so I lived in LA with our family friend Jim. If you remember him, this is the guy that found the school for me and who introduced me to the house church. So I, I lived in LA for some time. And actually two months after I got here, Ultra and Gloria, again, they sent me an email and asked if I would be willing to help them with the heart change workshop, which is coming up in a couple of days, uh, about one hour from, from where I live. And I said, sure, I, I would love to do that, to make, a, <laughs> to make a difference again. And it was during that workshop that I met Nick. And um, actually, Four months later, I decided to move from LA to Sacramento. It was very hard to move because I love LA and <laughs> I love the beaches and I love to run. So it was it was very very hard. I I did not know anybody here. I'm not kidding if I say I don't know anybody. I only know Nick. So I had to figure out a way how to meet people. But it wasn't that hard for me because one of my skills is networking and I'm able to develop relationships pretty fast and that's because of my, my, my time in the military during my peacekeeping missions because I was able, I had to communicate with people and to build relationships. So it wasn't that hard. In the meantime, I have a lot of friends, so thank you everybody for coming. I didn't expect that so many people would show up today. And after the, the heart change workshop, Ultra and Gloria asked me if I would be interested in uh, joining their, their ministry and to help them to spread this heart change workshop across the US, but also uh, to other countries and to reach all kinds of people. And I said, sure, I, I, I would love to do that. So I, they filed my, my visa paperwork as outreach coordinator. And in that role, I will be able to spread the heart change workshop across the US and around the world to all different people. So currently I'm waiting on the approval of my visa. So I would like to come now to the second part of my presentation. So now that you know my personal story, you probably know my, my visions and my passions and my goals. So in the next part, I really want to give you some practical tools and skills how to strive after significance. How are we doing time-wise? How much time do I have left? Six. Six minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I just, I just start and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so, who wants to make a difference? <laughs> we all want to make a difference. But how many people actually make a difference? Not, but in general, not everybody does. And this is like, to me, this is really, really sad. And why, why is that? So I would like to look with you into some of the reasons for that. And I learned some of those skills by listening 
to my pastor in, in Austria and I would like to share those skills uh, with you. I would like to start with a verse from the Bible. What does the green card mean? Oh, it means five minutes. <laughs> okay. I would like to start with a verse from the Bible uh, from Ecclesiastes 10.10 10, and it says, If the axe is dull and the edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. So what that verse is really saying is mean it, it, it means work smarter and not harder. So it's not about working hard, it's about working smart. So we need to have the right skills in life. So skill number one for me is and I actually asked Nick a couple days ago to make a list of all the skills that I have because sometimes it's very difficult for yourself to know what you're good at. So he came up with one with a couple things and one of those things was um, he said she can't stand critters or negative people, naysayers. And everybody who knows me knows that this is true. So skill number one for me is how to deal with negative people in your life, the naysayers that keep you from succeeding. And I can give you several examples of, of naysayers because there's a lot of naysayers and negative pessimistic people in Austria. And that's also one of the reasons why I decided to leave because I don't want to be surrounded by, by naysayers. Uh, also, one of the examples of, an, of naysayers was when I started my first mission in Kosovo as a liaison monitor and team commander, as a woman in, in that role. A lot of Austrian soldiers said, um, it'll not work, men will not talk to you. But this was not true. Everybody talked to me. And a lot of men talked to me because they love to talk to me and I actually got a lot of information. <laughs> so, I don't want to be surrounded by negative people. And naysayers are actually not bad people. They actually want what's best for you, but they are just mistaken. And the reason why they are mistaken is because they simply don't know what God said to you. I, I'm i getting assigned three minutes. Do you mind if I like yeah. talk a little longer? <laughs> because I want to get the message across. Is that okay? But if you need to leave, um, no, no, no. please um, feel free to leave. I'll skip some parts, but... I, I like to talk, <laughs> but I also like to listen. So, so again, they're not bad people, but they're, they're mistaken. And the reason why they're mistaken is because they don't know what God said to you. And, and as I said, my life is really a testimony of ignoring naysayers. And naysayers can actually stop the will of God if we listen to them. So how have you ever been like held back in your life? I think most of us have been held back. Uh, sometimes you're held back because of your age, your gender, the cult culture you live in, the, the country you grew up. And so the first barrier to reach your dream is, is delay. And the first group of people that actually can help you hold you back is your parents. Um, for instance, my mom always wanted me to become a, a pharmacist. And this would have been a total disaster because everybody who knows me knows that I hate prescription drugs. <laughs> so, so again, they're, they're not bad people. And besides your parents, also the culture, the society can be a barrier to your dream. The second thing that holds you back is, is discouragement. And that's when everybody around you thinks it can be done. And the question is really, who are you listening to about in your life? Are you listening to people who will say you will never make it? Or are you listening to people who encourage you? 
if you get only one thing out of that presentation today, then I would like to say to you, please don't hang around with negative people. Your best friends should not be negative people. The third barrier to your dream is disapproval. There will be people who, who question your motives. If you share a big dream with them, they just think you are on an ego trip. If you share a big goal, they just think you don't know what you're talking about. So this is the barrier of disapproval. And let the size of your God determine your goal. If you only attempt in life what you can do in your own power, you will have a puny little life. But if you, uh, if, 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 if your life, if your goal in life is something that you can achieve on your own, it's, it's not from God. Because God will give you a goal which will stretch you, grow you, deepen you, and it will be so big that you're bound to fail unless God fails you out. Coming to the end, I would like to share with you, or I would like to encourage you to do something with your talents and gifts. Stop just making it from one day to the other, from one paycheck to the next. Most of the people are exhausted, they come home, go to bed, just to get up in the morning and do do all over again the next day. Some of us try to get into the success stage of life and we often define that by the world standards and not by God's standards. But once we reach the success stage, we still feel empty and we still feel that something is missing. God wants all of us to live in the significance stage. He wants you to feel more significant and whole, more energized, with more confidence and significance. And you do that by discovering how God made you to be. To do something of significance and meaningfulness for me means to help people understand understand that God wants a personal relationship with each one of us. And one of the ways for me to do that is to spread the Heart Change Workshop around the world. I would like to start in, in Austria because it's a very dark spiritual place and polls actually indicate that in the US about 40 to 50 percent regularly attend church service while in Europe it's only eight percent or less so particularly um, Central Europe and Western Europe Austria Belgium France are very very dark and I want to do more things in my life which will continue to have an impact even after I die. So to sum up, success is about you, what you want to achieve in life, but significance is about others, what difference you can make in other people's life. So success is okay, but significance is way greater. <laughs>